All righty, we got 45 minutes, it's nine o'clock. Let's get started. All right, so we're gonna talk about CICD with GitHub Actions today, all right? My name is Chris Ayers. I am a senior customer engineer at Microsoft. I'm part of the Azure engineering team. Uh, we have a group there under Scott Guthrie called CXP, Customer Experience, and I'm part of that in a team called Fast Track for Azure. So there's some Fast Track for Azure stickers over there. We help customers implement stuff on Azure. Uh, we do security, we do DevOps. We, we, we just really help you kind of get going and implemented. You can find me on all the socials, on all the thingies, um, and you can go out to my GitHub. This has, my profile on GitHub has links to all my talks, um, and my blog has a couple of links to talks as well. So we're going to talk about YAML. We're going to talk about CICD because they're letters and you know we, we got to define our terms. We're going to at a high level talk about actions and then we're just going to do demos, like lots of demos. Like we'll just be on GitHub. Let's just start out. Who's really good with YAML? Okay, so let's talk about it. There's like three basic rules to YAML. Lists kind of start with a dash and a space. Objects or key value, well, key values are just the key colon the value. And then objects are like a key with a colon and then properties. They can be key values, they can be lists. Let's play with those. Let's just go ahead and play around. So I have a link to an online parser. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So I have a dog named Xena. So this is a key value and it transpiles over to Jason. That's all it is, J J Jason, Jason, under the hood, okay? Um, you know, she has, uh, you know, she, she likes, uh, oh, let me do this one. Her favorite things, let's do a list, treats, belly rubs, naps. So, cool. made a list of stuff, okay? Notice these are all kind of indented the same level. If you don't, don't like you, if you do too much, it actually will think that this is an extra space and it'll concatenate and then you get some weird stuff. You can always validate your YAML. It's pretty easy to do. Another cool thing that YAML lets you do that you can't do in JSON is you can have comments that's nice, right? I mean, there's an extension for JSON that does that called JSON-C. Um, and then we can, we can put it all together. So Xena, you know, has some, has some favorite things. And I can come down and fix this guy, boom. I gotta fix that guy. And I don't know why it's freaking out over the other thing. It shouldn't. This is the first time I've used this one. So anyways, back to what we were doing. So YAML. If you screw up, you can put it into converter. You can put it in a thing. So CI, CD. We talk about that. CI, everyone knows. Continuous integration, right? Maybe we do some code. We check in. We build. Run unit tests. Maybe release out to dev, run, you know, acceptance tests, something like that. Pretty, pretty common workflow for, for developers, right? When we talk about CD, though, do we, do we mean continuous delivery or do we mean continuous deployment? Because those are actually two separate things that a lot of people don't always think about. Um, and I, I just like to bring it up because, you know, we do all that other stuff, but then maybe we want to go out to production. Is there a human in the loop? that looks at it, checks a box, or do we have automation in place? Does it meet our definition of done? Does it meet our quality definition? If it does, why, does, why do we need to stop? Just let it automatically flow. So these are push button deployments, but in one case, the human pushes the button, and in the other case, it's just met all of the requirements, and it just goes. So when I talk about 
CD, like these really are your process. GitHub Actions will let you do either one. GitHub Actions will let you automate all this stuff. It'll let approval sit in place. Like it's up to you. You can do either way. All right. It's not going to stop you. So let's talk about actions. They are event driven. Okay, something happens and it runs your job. Um, they all live in the .github workflows folder. So any repo out there, you can actually just go and look in the .github folder and there should be a workflows folder and you can look in it and you'll see all the workflows and they're all in YAML, which is why we talk about YAML. Um, there are a lot of events that trigger workflows. I'll show you them. Um, so event happens, runs a job. Jobs contain one or more steps, script actions, shell commands. These all run in order. So like step one, step two, step three. They, they will run top to bottom in a very defined order. Now when I say that there's events that can trigger uh, workflows, all these on the side are events. So like we can have a branch protection rule. Somebody tried to push code to a branch they shouldn't. We ran a check during a run. We created a branch or um, you know, we did something like that. We're deleting a branch. We're doing a deployment. We're having a discussion. So you can trigger events not just on code, push, or PR. You can do it on somebody forked your repo. Somebody left an issue or tagged it. Like this is fully event driven and their event are just all over the place. And so you can do some really complex things with this. Like somebody tagged it or added a label or an issue. Originally, they used to use that for a lot of the release process where you might tag it with dev or prod and then it would realize that you tagged it and then it would release it to that environment. You can do that if you want. The tools are there. But what if we want more than one job? We want that CD job, we want that build job, we want to run tests, how do we, def what do we do? Well, we can have more than one job. Now, these jobs, when you kick them off, if you don't say anything about dependencies, it'll try to run them both at the same time. So you can have multiple, multiple jobs in your workflow, you can have multiple workflows, it'll try to kick off 20 workflows, each one might have jobs, it'll just try to kick them all off in parallel to as many, parallel jobs as you have. <laughs> so these will run in parallel, those will run sequentially inside the job. Let's go see what that looks like. Um, you know, because next we're, we're gonna really dive into stuff, but um, let's go out there. So this is my repo. And I said, if you look in the GitHub workflow folder, which is where I am, you can have all your jobs. Now, if you look, I've got a lot of workflows. Like, it's not just one CI, CD. I, and with, like, with DevOps, you have to say, I want to add a pipeline, and I have an existing file, and I will point it at my file, and then it will make an entry in DevOps to go, I'm going to run this thing when stuff happens. GitHub, you make a file, and you put it in this folder. If it sees the event, it's going to run the workflow. There's no registration. Creating the file is enough. So let's look at what one of these things looks like. Can you guys see that okay? Or here, let me make it a little bit bigger. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. All right. So I can give it a name. If I don't give it the name, it'll just use the workflow file name. It'll, it'll just use the file name. Um, this is a different way of doing lists. And I'm doing lists on one line. And these, this on, are what we call triggers. These are the events that will cause this workflow to run. And I'm gonna do like, if I push code up, if I do a pull request, and then there's a special one workflow dispatch. I'll, I'll talk to you guys about that one in one sec. And then I have a list of jobs. And I have given, I have a job named build. And it runs on Ubuntu. So Ubuntu latest. I'll show you how to figure this stuff out. And then I have some steps. I have a step that's gonna check out my code and then it's going to run hello world. Okay. So if I want to go look at this, I can go to the actions tab of my repo and I can see all of these, these things running. And let me just back up one. 
And so this was my basic workflow and it had recently ran. I can see like that job build that we talked about. And I can dig into my job and then there is that checkout and it checked out all my code. That is my hello world that it ran. Ran shell with bash. But it also has some other stuff. So there's a setup job, cleanup checkout, and a complete job. If we look at this setup job, we can actually see, yep, I'm on Ubuntu. I'm on LTS for Ubuntu. And there's a runner image. And it actually has a list out here of all of the software that is on the GitHub hosted runners. So when we talk about runners, every job um, will run in a folder, like in a, in a runner. Um, but like, yeah, we got Python, we got Ruby, we got pip. They've set up uh, all sorts of crazy tools. So anytime a hosted runner runs, uh, it has a link to what is the version and what software is out there and defined which tells you for most things, you're gonna have all the tools you need if you use a hosted runner. If not, you might need... PowerShell. <laughs> what, where's PowerShell? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah it is. There's PowerShell on here. You, you, were, you were saying something about PowerShell? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, were, 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 you, were you coming at me in my own talk? <laughs> I got receipts. Okay, this is, this is Linux, it, it's already got the modules pre-installed, it's got Pester pre-installed, like it's here. Come on guys, you gotta do better than that. <laughs> yeah, it might be early for you. All right, so, you know, going back to um, runners, just for a sec. Every time there's a job that kicks off, this is gonna be on a runner, this is gonna be on a runner. Now it could be a container, could be a VM in like a separate folder, like, but these are essentially isolated. They essentially start from scratch every time. So keep that in mind. Like, you know, you might say, hey, I wanna check out some code and compile and then upload the artifact. Hey, I depend on that guy, I wanna download the artifact and keep doing stuff. But let, let, let's get into that, let, let's start running some stuff. Let, let, let's have a little bit more fun. So. We talked about triggers, we talked about all the cool uh, things that are in this job. Well, what if I want to have other triggers? Like what, what are some other options? You know, I said on push, on whatever. Well, this guy, this guy has some other on stuff. So I can say, I can limit my branches. So I could be like, hey, only on my dev branch or only on like certain release stuff. I can do star star so I can kind of glob the things. I can say I only want to run this pipeline on certain tags, uh, certain paths of files, pull requests on certain branches. And if you really want to do, you can even do a cron job. Okay, like, like it's all here. Now, the thing I talked about before, workload dispatch. Out of the box, you can't say, hey, just run this pipeline. That's an event. So you need to tell it, I want you to run on an event. The event is workflow dispatch. I'm going to tell you to run the event. There's some other ones out there like workflow call. So if you have reusable pipelines, if you're, if you're calling one pipeline from another, there's another event. All right, let's keep moving. We got a lot to cover. So multiple jobs. What does multiple jobs look like? Well. I've got jobs, one, two. Now they each have a runs on, now you can kind of extract some of that. There's, there's some other things in the schema where you can define defaults, like it's gonna run on this machine, it's gonna do that, but this is pretty clear, like run on Ubuntu latest. They also have, um, the other one was they also have um, Mac, they have, um, Windows, they have all of that there. And docs are awesome. Like you can just do a couple of searches and pretty much find anything you need. So, yep, here we go. They have both Windows, Linux, and Mac machines with different specifications and you can actually pick like what you need um, to run it on. Okay. 
So let's get back to runs. So that was two jobs. Uh, and the job one and job two are those keywords or those arbitrary names. Arbitrary names. We, we can name them whatever we want. In fact, let's run them and see what happens. Yeah. You, you, you mean like, like this one that, that shows all my stuff? Yeah, I'm going to get to it. <laughs> Don't worry, man. I got you. So we got our job. Here's how we do it. So run, and I can pick the branch I want. So I'm going to run this right now, and you give it a sec, it'll refresh. There's our job. You can see we have multiple jobs, one, two, and three, and it actually visualizes them. And if you notice, three finish first, because they all start in parallel. Like we didn't tell it job one or two is more important than the others. Let's try that again with dependencies, and I'll show you how dependencies work. Like I said, we're, we're gonna run pipelines, we're gonna dive into stuff. Because when you leave here, you should have the tools to go at least understand workflows and probably write them too. So this time, notice there's a box for one, a box for two, and a box for three, and they're waiting on each other, all right? And let's go take a look at how we define that. Yep, there it goes two. So, just like before, except, two is needy, it's codependent. It's like, hey, I can't live my life without one going first. I can't do my job until Two is finished. So needs is the keyword where we can force dependencies between our stages, okay? Our, our jobs. Yep, yep. You, you keep getting ahead, man. Why do you keep doing that? No, you're, you're fine. You're, you're, you're cool. You, I, mean, I got you, man. I mean, conditions is right there, okay? We're on two. I mean, that, that's five. I got a flow. <laughs> Don't worry. All right, so you know, I said we have steps. We've got uh, scripts we can run. We've got steps we can run, actions. So let's look at what this looks like. So I've got my build job here. You know, it's setting up the job. And we're going to see some stuff. We're going to explore the marketplace. So, ooh, lots of stuff just flew by. What just happened? Let's go take a look. All right, so first, we're actually showing our path for Bash, for CMD, which on Linux, they don't have CMD, right? It's not Windows, it's Linux. But we got PowerShell, because of course we have PowerShell, but we don't have PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, because we're on Linux. Well, uh, th this is on Linux. Um, we also have Python. We can just invoke. We can do an arbitrary Perl uh, if we so choose. Um, and let, let's, you know, we, can, we have this action to check out with, with an at and versions. Let's look at what this is and, and let's talk about that for a sec. So when, where did it go? So when you want to define a step, you can do a couple of things. So out of the box, you can, you can specify your shell parameter. On Windows, I think it defaults to CMD or PowerShell, but on Linux, it defaults to Bash. But you can overwrite it. You, know, you, you can completely overwrite it and say, I want to do CMD, I want to do PowerShell. And then you can just have inline scripts, like right here in your workflow file. If you want to do a multi-line script, you just add a, a run with a pipe, and then you can do multi-line. Um, I'll, I'll show you that in a sec. Yeah, right here. So you could do multi-line by putting a vertical pipe on the, the run line. Um, you could also have in your repo a PowerShell file, and then you could say, you know, just the path to the, the PowerShell file, and it would invoke it through the shell. So, so you have different ways to do that. And then we have actions. So it's called GitHub Actions. It's called Actions because that's what we're going to talk about now, in case you had a question about it. <laughs> so actions are 
where people can package up units of functionality. Companies do it. There's like an Azure login action. There's deploy actions. And so you can specify the, the, the hash of the git commit so you can lock your stuff to a specific version. If it's an action that's on the marketplace, it has to be a public repo. You can see the source code. You can see the issues. You can go look at how they do it. So you can do the hash. You can do a version. You can specify different versions. You can specify branches. How do I even know checkout exists? How do I know that there's versions or ats? Well, I already told you the answer. It's the marketplace. So let's go to the marketplace. So this is the marketplace. It's right at the top. Most people don't even notice it's there, I, I think. So you know, if I look for checkout, so there's apps, which I don't, I don't, I don't really care about apps. I really just want you know, just actions. And I've got one here by actions, which is GitHub proper. And it's got a blue check mark. They didn't have to pay $8 for it. So, uh, I like them already. Um, and then we've got other ones with stars. We can see the stars if it's got um, people liking it. We can see you know, third party people, just random people out there publishing it. But if we go into these, we can see every version they have out there because it's public. We can pick a specific version. And on most of them, they will show you how to use it and parameters that go with it, with descriptions of the parameters. Now, if I'm like, oh, this is really awesome. I wonder how it works. You know, we, get, we see all the contributors. Let's just go to the repo because they have their repo because it's public. I can go poke around in here and I can look at, you know, their testing packages and their configuration. It's all public. Um, I can go file an issue if I want with it because it's all open and public and we make things better together. So we can look at our issues, we can submit pull requests, all this stuff. So cool. Well, I did a thing here for a second. I was like, hey, we're, we're talking about parameters for these things. I hate hard coding stuff. You know, I'm, a, I'm a dev. Uh, hard, hard code bad, right? So what if we do variables? Who likes variables? Everybody likes variables. So. Let us look at variables for a sec. And actually, just for you, I will start doing it in VS Code. So there is an extension that they've added for GitHub Actions in VS Code um, right here. You can go find it. It is the official GitHub one. It's awesome. Um, my repo actually has a dev container. So if you know what dev containers are, this has a dev container set up for Markdown editing and the action. Um, I, I would, I would be explicit in your versions, like, like just pick the latest and, and like, if you're looking at the marketplace, um, wherever I was, like, just, just do whatever they say. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, like if, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to do Azure, right? So I want to do an Azure login so I can authenticate to Azure. I'll just say use latest version. Cool. Copy pasta, you know? Yeah. Give, give a little copy copy, paste it in your thing. Um, and then you can learn more about it down below. Like the parameters and stuff it, it needs. But for the most part, pretty much always pick a version. You can do a high level, you know, version. So this, uh, the action uh, extension, uh, it'll show you some stuff we're gonna get to, but you can see all my workflows. It's picked them all up. I can actually click into it and see all the runs. So this is talking out to GitHub and I can see the, the latest runs and the steps. I can click on it and open the workflow and it'll pull up my workflow from my repo, which is awesome. So how about variables? Well, I can do environmental variables, very easy, ENV. Um, and then I, just like before, I key value pairs. Hello, name, 
And I can use them just like I would environment variables on whatever my shell is. So for this one, it's bash, but I would do it in a PowerShell style if I was doing PowerShell. I can do environment variables. Okay. That's not very sexy. Well, there's some, uh, what's interesting is there's also, yeah, that's fine. You know, we, we can have environments at the workflow level. So your file, these will be the same environment variables on all of your jobs. But then you can also define different environment variables at your job level. So there's a hierarchy there. And we can then define different ones at our step level. And they recently made some changes about a month ago. You can have org level variables and repo level variables as well. I'll show you those. But what do you think the output is of this line? What, what, what do you think it's going to say when I run it? It's, it's going to have to grab variables from like my workflow. It's going to have to grab variables from my, uh, my job, my step. So if we run this guy and we look at its output. Yeah, I think I have to go out to the web to see it. Then we can dig in. So it's going to override things. It's going to be the more specific, you know, if you do it at an org level and then you define it in your step, the step will win because it's closer if you use the exact same name. So out here on GitHub itself, there is a settings tab. And in the settings tab, you can come down to actions. And uh, where's the secrets? Yeah, down here. We can go down to secrets for actions. And there are variables. So we can also define in variables here for the whole repo. So these are repo level uh, variables that we can look at. So this is a relatively new thing. There's also org level secrets. So maybe you want to have like an org prefix and you define it at the org level and then everybody uses that same value. You, you can tap into it. Um, all right. Let's keep going real quick. So you talked about conditionals. You want to conditionally do stuff. You were, you were jumping ahead. We're now caught up. Okay. So what if you want to do some sort of conditionals? Well, we can do an if. Okay. We can do an if with those environment variables. We're using kind of the dollar handlebar syntax. Um, we can, this, this is what we call a context. This is the environment context. There's a lot of other context we can tap into as well. But like because I say the greeting is hello, this should run hello, but not goodbye. And it, it's actually real easy to see. You know, if we come out here to the web. Well, eh -eh, didn't run. So we you can use this to define jobs or stages, essentially steps, where maybe you do your build and compile and test, and only if it's on the main branch or only if you're in a certain environment does it do a deploy. So you can have it all in one workflow and conditionally do some jobs. Which, again, brings me to uh, some other stuff. We, we've got this if here. There's some other expressions. now. Uh, GitHub has added some programmability into the YAML. So we've got these type of things where we can do formatting and we can kind of use this to compose up names of variables. We can do like an ends with to do tests if we're looking for branch names. We can do a contains. We can do a from JSON. So we, we can do JSON to make like arrays of objects or, or lists. We can also uh, do joins, so we could do you know, comma-separated lists. All pretty easy to leverage. And then once you put it in some sort of variable, you can then reference it down below. So that's all pretty easy there. And I'm just trying to move along because I want to show some end-to-end -end stuff, some good stuff. Yeah, they're, they're, they're their own kind of thing. Uh, I think I have the doc link for it. Yeah, so they, uh, yeah, he, the, there's good documentation on all the expressions that you can do 
um, like dealing with literals and exponents. Like th th there's a whole set of documentation on the capabilities you have. Um, let's go back. Well, let me go to the other, uh, that was conditional. Let me come down here to expressions. Yeah, see, so yeah, I, th these were the, uh, the variable. You can see the variable name and then the output from it. Okay. Just because I told it to print it. Um, all right. So that, that's high level expressions. What's interesting now is context. So I mentioned that ENV was a context. Well, there's a bunch of other contexts out there. So um, we have a GitHub context that's going to show you like the commit ID or the PR number. So if you want to make dynamic stuff like based on uh, some of the information from the repo, what branch are you on, what, what's the commit ID, folders, files changed, the person who did it, was it a push? You can do that. You can get, um, depending upon what you do, uh, I'll touch on strategy and matrix, but you can figure out your runner OS so you can know if it's Windows or Mac or Linux. You can look at your job or steps to see what runner you're on, what, what uh, uh, outputs of any steps. So if I run this, what we get on the context stuff, and I don't usually show everything, but we dump a lot of these out to logs. So like my job context is gonna ha tell me, like I can add outputs and stuff to it. Um, you know, like do I have outputs? What was the conclusion? information about my runner and like some of the path names. The GitHub one can contain some sensitivity, you know, like my hashes and like usernames and like who's doing it, and, you know, all sorts of information about the repo. So it's real interesting stuff and you can leverage this to help do things in your, your workflows. Now we start getting into some more interesting things. So we also have, I mentioned those, those environment variables. You know, we can just leverage, you know, vars. So that, that is that, that tab I showed you in GitHub uh, under secrets and variables. So I can access the vars that way. So I can get like, and with the extension, you know, we were talking about the extension. They actually have this little settings things down here. I can see those same variables for my repo right here. You know, so if I run this guy, let me turn that off and like this, run, run, run. I can trigger it running right from here. So I should see a three and go look at it run. Look at my history. So I have job name defined. I just, I made it the same name as the variable. Um, yep, setting up. And hello world step didn't run, but it's got some variables. Like I can come down here and say, hello world enabled. Oh, it's false. Yes, I want it to run my hello world. I can then rerun my job. So I can edit my repository and org level variables right from the extension. It, it does the syntax highlighting, it does the checking. It, it's a nice um, add-on and they, they've come out with it recently, like in the last, um, month or two, like, like they've really done some nice work with the extension. See, so it, you know, hello, PowerShell Summit. Um, so I highly recommend the extension if you're going to use that. So secrets, let's talk about secrets. We have none. I don't trust anybody. Zero trust, zero trust forever. But if you want to use secrets, 
we can just use the secrets context. So it's another context, secrets dot. If I reference a secret that doesn't exist, it's just gonna return an empty string. It's not gonna throw an error. So if somebody malicious had access to your repo, they couldn't just sit there trying like admin password that's trying to figure out your naming scheme. It would just, it'll just give you back empty, empty blanks. Um, there is something to keep in mind, you know, so I have a secret here and if I pass it this way, it could potentially show up on the command line, right? Because if somebody was, you know, doing processor dumps or looking at logs, it might show on the command line. This way we can pass it as an environment variable and just reference it as an environment variable. And so that actually looks differently when you run it. You know, if we look at that, GitHub's smart, so they try to blank it out, but you can see on the, on the line, uh, it, it shows you there was a secret there on that line. But if you pass it by environments, like you see, hey, they were referencing environment variables. It's just something to think about as you like deal with secrets and pass them around. But we, we mess, uh, we manipulate the secrets either with that extension or in the settings, um, secrets and variables, actions. So we, we can have secrets for our repository, secrets at our org level, and then you can see here, it says environment secrets, which actually leads me into uh, environments. So environments, are under settings, environments. You can make however many environments you want. Um, I have a new environment, you know. Configure my environment. I can, th this is not as fleshed out as some of the other C CD systems. Like I can have required reviewers and a wait timer. I can do more with custom apps. Uh, I can make some protection rules like, hey, it needs to be from a protected branch like main. Um, and then I can add secrets specific to this environment, variable specific to this environment. There is some newer like branch protection rules they have in place, but as far as the very full featured approval flow you might see in a DevOps, it's, it's, not, it's not here. Um, all right, we got about 10 minutes left, so I speed up. So I mentioned matrix. So matrix builds, this is for you guys doing libraries. So, you know, in this case, it's a node example, but I want to test my library on three different versions of node and two different operating systems. Nobody would ever do that with like maybe a PowerShell module or anything, right? You, you would never want to test it. But if you did, notice there's a different context being used, matrix. So we're doing the matrix OS just like a variable and matrix node version, just like the variable there. And what that does is it actually makes this really interesting set of like, uses it like a job template. So there's one that gets created for every OS and version combo, and it runs all of the tests kind of in parallel. You know, saying use version of this, run this thing. So matrix is really cool when you're building a library, you're validating things on lots of stuff. A um, couple other real quick things. You know, sometimes you do infrastructure as code and you want to validate things on a PR. Like in this case, I have the GitHub context and I'm actually ac accessing which event and number. So it's going to be like PR 27. It'll make PR underscore 27 is my variable name. So I'm gonna dynamically pick a resource group name based on the PR number, which means I have a unique context that's around my PR. And so what I can do is I can leverage other workflows. So I could call out to like, I wanna lint my stuff the same way every time and I can invoke that. I can, you know, we're passing secrets, you know, starting to put stuff together now. We're gonna pass secrets uh, to log into Azure. Maybe we create a resource group on the fly based on the PR. We're gonna dynamically create an environment and deploy it out there based on the PR so I can look at it. And it's gonna even give me the website name so I can talk about outputs. So sometimes we know 
uh, like with infrastructure as code, you might not know the name of the thing you're creating. You create it and it gives you the URL, right? Has anyone done that? Yeah, so what if the pipeline could use that? Pipeline could take the output, we could put it in a variable, then use it on a later step to deploy to the thing we just created. So that's what this does. So I do an ARM deploy and I say, hey, this is ID deploy. Like you need to have an ID to get outputs. But then this is saying, hey, get the steps, dot deploy, get its outputs, and then get whatever the HAP service name is. That, that, that's down here in like app service service name. Like that's the output of my bicep file. But yeah, so we, we can start putting these things together and dynamically create an environment. And so this runs on pull requests. So when I open a pull request, it's going to create environments, it's going to create infrastructure, deploy out to it. What about when we're done? If I have to go out and clean up all that stuff, just set a to-do, reminder, auto-delete. What if we could say, hey, when we close our pull request, so we get those extra events, we know it's a type of pull request that's closed. We still know the event number. We still know it's a pull request 27. Hey, just log back in and delete it. I looked at it, it looks good, go away. So actions is just flexible. It just gives you tools and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, I mentioned in this one that we were calling another workflow that just lives in my directory. I just did like a uses. This one has that other event I mentioned earlier, workflow call. So I can call into another workflow. I can just check out my code, run bicep build. Just, just validate that it lints. Anyone use Docker? Okay, what if I want to do a Docker image? And I want to, you know, I can set my working environment. I want to log in the Docker Hub. So I can use the Docker login action. I can log in the Docker Hub. I could build and push. So this is out there in the work marketplace for Docker. It does the build and it pushes the image up with these tags. Notice I've done the pipe, so I do multiple lines and I actually do a latest and I do the image name with the SHA of GitHub. So I have a unique one and then it also overrides to the latest. So we can work with, we, we could invoke like a trivi scan if we wanted to scan our container, we, we can do that too. So it's super flexible. Um, how do you get started? You know, we got a couple minutes, I wanna save some time, a minute or two for question. Um, you can just come here and say new workflow, okay? Like, they have lots of options, okay? You, you can go find one, like I wanna do a Docker image one. It gives you a, a lot of the starting things and you can search the marketplace. So I can come over here and search Docker. PowerShell. So, all right. Now you can also debug stuff locally. There's this thing called Nextos app, uh, act, and it runs a Docker image locally, and you just you can tell it, hey, go run my workflow file, and you give it secrets, so you can do your stuff locally, debugging and testing before you have to publish it and run it. If you're worried about that, it's pretty neat. Um, so any questions? And I'll just leave this up while we're talking. Yeah. I got kind of two. The first one is um, if you don't like to do the secrets, well, how do you recommend storing like API keys and stuff to publish after you know you do all your workflow? Or how would you do it? I guess. Um, I usually store secrets in uh, either something like Azure Key Vault, and I'll in the step pull them down and put it in an environment variable, and then pass that into the thing. Or I'll do secrets in GitHub itself. So my, my second question on part of that is like, is there any like security around this? So you couldn't have, you know, someone just who might have a PR access and they automatically merge in with malicious code that then uses your API secrets and goes and publishes that stuff somewhere? Well, I know um, anytime somebody forks it, it won't run any of their st any of that stuff. Um, okay. Like, like if, if I forked it, I don't have any access to the secrets. It won't run any of my workflows by default. I actually have to go in and enable them. And on PR, um, like if you're dumb and you, if, if you just emerge, approve the PR, 
it's kind of on you. Uh, but there is uh, GitHub Advanced Security that can do secret scanning and bin scanning and push protection and that stuff to stop you from pushing secrets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you make <coughs> private GitHub actions for a private repo? Yep. You can do private repos. You can do composite actions, reusable actions, and workflows. Um, this is all GitHub Enterprise Cloud. You can do all the same stuff pretty much on GitHub Enterprise Server, the on-prem version, and control which actions are available and make your own and reference them from other repos and private ones, yeah. But if it's on the marketplace, it's public. They also did skills.github. So I said if you do an issue or you fork it or discussion, you can run workflows. They made a training platform using that, <laughs> which is neat. It's free. Anybody else? What else you got? Yeah. Can you give us any uh, scenarios to explain why you may want to choose to do a separate workflow versus a separate action, a separate job? Um, I, I don't like it when you build and deploy a lot in the exact same step. I'm a big fan of feeling fast and like having compilation and testing kind of in one and then building an artifact, like uploading your artifact. So there's jobs in there too. You know, you like you compile it and you publish to an output folder and then you publish the output folder to as a action output. That makes it real easy to like keep reusing that and just do your deploy step, tweak your config, do your deploy step. Like it, it isolates things. And because you have an artifact, that's a very good point in time. That's the binary that was built. Like if you have just build and deploy all in one, you can go back to the shot hash, but versions of things might have changed since you built it. And when you build it, it might be a different build materials going into your binary. So I, I always separate the compilation and the deployment and have an artifact in between. Um, you can have deploy it out to dev, run a, create an environment, run a load test, uh, do secret scanning. You can do all those things in parallel if they don't have dependencies. Um, and then a lot of times you can reuse that same type of workflow in other, other uh, pipelines, other repos. Um, I was just wondering, if you had like, say, similar repos that um, your published pipeline might be all the same, your build pipeline, can you share those workflows across repos? Or you can have org level workflows uh, and, and job templates, essentially, like reusable workflows or composite actions, and you can use those as building blocks. Another change GitHub recently made is you can have required workflows. So you can say as an org, we want every pipeline, we want this workflow to run on every repo, like a secret scanning or a linter or something. Check the docs, it's good stuff. Anybody else? Hey, let's get a quick selfie before you guys go. Or if you're staying for my second talk on load testing, you can just stay where you are. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you.